The Distinguished Service Award is awarded for exemplary and or extraordinary service in securing the nation from foreign or domestic threats, advancing the interests of our nation abroad, working toward unifying the American people beyond these worthy efforts, and doing so ensuring national sovereignty, advancing world peace. This year's awardee is truly set apart as a lifelong servant, a leader, and an influencer on the world stage. Born in Jersey City, New Jersey, Martin Edward Dempsey was the eldest grandson of four Irish immig immigrants. Following high school, Dempsey would go on to attend the United States Military Academy at West Point, graduating in 1974 and receiving his commission into the United States Army as an armor officer. Over the course of his 41 years in our nation's military, General Dempsey would deploy for operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm, and multiple times for Operation Iraqi Freedom, command troops at every level, earned three master's degrees to include one from Duke University. He would serve as the 37th Army Chief of Staff and complete his career as the 18th Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. During his tenure as Chairman, Time Magazine named General Dempsey as one of their 100 most influential people. It was on that list for his dedication, his commitment, his selflessness in passionately leading America's warfighters at a critical time in our nation's history. General Dempsey continues his passion for service, now teaching leadership and public po policy as a Rubenstein Fellow at the esteemed Duke University and as chairman of USA Basketball. He remains a true agent of change for America as he speaks across the world to share his principles of leadership in an effort to unify and foster international relations. Among his many accolades are best-selling author of two books on leadership, inductee of the New Jersey and Irish American Halls of Fame, recipient of the Association of the United States Army George Catlett Marshall Medal for Distinguished Public Service, and title Honorary Knight Commander of the Order of the British Empire by Queen Elizabeth II. Not bad for an Irish kid from Jersey. <laughs> Comrades, guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor and privilege to present the 2022 VFW Distinguished Service Award to the 18th Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, retired Army General Martin E. Dempsey. Distinguished Service Award and Citation presented to General Retired Martin E. Dempsey in special recognition and sincere appreciation of his more than four decades of faithful and exceptional service to the United States of America. A lifelong servant and military leader, General Martin E. Dempsey served 41 years in the United States Army, culminating as the 37th Army Chief of Staff and completing his career as the 18th Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in 2015. His dedication, commitment, and selflessness in passionately leading America's warfighters at a critical time in our nation's history earned him recognition worldwide. Even today, General Dempsey continues to shape future leaders of this country as a best-selling author and teacher of leadership at Duke University. General Dempsey's service to our country reflects extraordinary credit upon himself, the United States Army, the Department of Defense, and the United States of America, and has justly earned him the utmost respect and appreciation of the veterans of foreign wars of the United States. In witness whereof, we have hereunto set our hands in the official seal of the veterans of foreign wars of the United States this 18th day of July, 2022, 
approved by the National Council of Administration, signed by Matthew Fritz Mihelchek, Commander in Chief, and Kevin Jones, Adjutant General. Thank you very much. I didn't hear much of a outbreak when we mentioned New Jersey here. Who, who's here from New Jersey? Right behind me. <laughs> right, right behind me. No, that's great. And uh, we got to keep working on that, Fritz. We got to, got to get some more Jersey people in this organization. They don't want that. <laughs> um, before I begin, I want to make sure, you know, that, that resume uh, is, is the byproduct of, uh, of a lot of years. But lest you become too impressed with it, I have to tell you the backstory of the Time magazine, uh, uh, one of the world's 100 most influential leaders. So when my XO, my executive officer, came in and told me that while I was serving as chairman, uh, I said, oh, that's, that's nice. And he said, well, sir, aren't you really excited about this? And I said, yeah, I mean, I guess, but I just don't know exactly what that means. Um, but um, yeah, sure, I'm excited. Now, secretly, that was my outer persona that I was portraying, because one of the traits of leadership that I value most in, in leaders is humility. And so, you know, I didn't want to start high-fiving people around the office for the Time Magazine Award. So, but I was pretty excited about it. And so I found out when the magazine was going to actually be published. And it was about six weeks later it was going to be published. So I waited patiently. Um, but on the day that I knew it was going to be put on the shelves at, like, Barnes & Noble, um, I, I escaped from my quarters at Fort Myer. And I say escape because the security guys and, and men and women did not like the chairman wandering downtown, you know, to go shopping at Barnes & Noble without them. I'm not, I'm not sure why Barnes & Noble was a particular threat. But they didn't want me going down there. But I didn't want to go down there with them. And so I, I snuck out and went down, and, and I hurried over to the magazine rack, and I uh, found copies. There were about 20 of them. I took five. My theory was I was going to keep one, give one to each of my three children, and give one to my mother. So I, I, I wandered over to the checkout counter, and I, as I'm wandering, I decide to look and see what they've got in there that makes mention of me as one of these individuals. And I found it finally. I found the page. And I was in between. In, there were probably five or six of these uh, uh, little bios on every page. And mine was stuck between the pictures of Kanye West and Kim Jong-un. So I thought to myself, well, it's a good thing I didn't get too excited because I'm not sure I want to be, in, at least in, in Kim Jong-un's company, that's not something I was actually aspiring to do. But I did give them, I gave the magazines away, and the one I kept for myself is safely buried in a, in a drawer someplace in my office. I accept this award as I have accepted any other award in my professional life on behalf of the men and women with whom I serve, and importantly, their families, because my wife, Dini, has been at my side through this entire journey. We're high school sweethearts. We have three kids, nine grandchildren. All three of my children served, and I'm very proud of that. So on behalf of those who have served our country in uniform, and particularly those like you who served it overseas and in harm's way, I accept this award. I want to also uh, thank the veterans of foreign wars for, for everything you mean to soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, and their families. And um, as preparation for, for this, receiving this award, I, you know, I, I am a member, I'm a lifetime member, but I also went and looked at the, um, the website to learn a little more about your mission, your vision, your leadership, your culture. And one of the things I took away from that is the mission statement includes three things, importantly. Obviously, one is to ensure that the men and women who have served their country in harm's way continue to have the respect of the American people. Another part of your mission is 
to support those men and women, especially those who need it, who are suffering whatever um, effects of their service have brought to them. And then finally, it's, it's continue to support and advocate for the military and its role in our national security and its relationship with the American people. And so I, I thank you very much for that. But I'm going to hint at you today, maybe there should be a fourth mission that you take on. You, you already take it on, but perhaps you should think about taking it on with, either, with even greater urgency. And I'll tell you about that by telling you about my experience in traveling here. I, like many of you, went to my local airport and I was waiting for the plane to Kansas City. And lo and behold, I'm surrounded by veterans, which was great because you all were traveling on the same day, or many of you were traveling on the same day that I was traveling. And we did what veterans always do. We, if we recognize each other, we, we talk about our experiences, where did we serve, when did we serve, who were the, the figures of history with whom we served, how long did we serve, but, you know, and, and I loved it. I just, I enjoy, the, that's really one of the reasons I'm so happy that the Veterans of Foreign Wars exist, because, you know, we are a group with something important in common. And when we gather, we talk about the things we have in common. But here's the thing that struck me because of, uh, as uh, Fritz was mentioning, I'm teaching civil military relations at West Point. I'm also trying to help the Army in other ways, not just the Army, the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines, with some of our recent recruiting challenges. They're very, you know, they're, they're public record. We're having trouble recruiting now. And we're having trouble, we, by the way, we've always had some ups and downs in recruiting, you know that. But we're having some troubles now be, uh, that feel particularly troublesome because the propensity to serve, that's the fancy word they give it, is, is declining. And it's declining in every, in every poll that's taken. The most recent one was Gallup. And so what it, it occurred to me that when we talk together about our shared experiences, one of the things we may not be talking about enough is not just what we did when we served, but why we served, why we served. Now, mind you, that's not why you went into the military or why you came out but it's why you did what you did while you were there. And what you were doing in those years was serving your country. And what you were doing in serving your country was finding common purpose with those around you, the men and women to your left and right. You were finding a set of values that you embraced. And in so doing, it changed your life. I don't think there's anybody in this room that would disagree that service in the military is a life-changing experience. And it's a life-changing experience that's positive and that allows us to highlight what we have in common and get away for moments, at least, from highlighting what we disagree about. And so my challenge to you today, and I'm embracing it myself, is if we want America's young men and women to once again be excited about serving their country, we've got to help them understand why that's important and what it meant to us personally. This generation responds to personal interaction, to personal stories, much more so than they respond to ads on a television show or, or in the middle of a sporting event. We've got to get out there and make sure that the young men and women who we are raising, who are, whether they're our children or our grandchildren, understand the value of service, and in our case in particular, the value of service in the military, or we're going to have trouble for years to come. Now, that's my challenge to you. Talk about why you served, you personally, and I think we'll be able to do some good together. Now, I've got here in my hand, this is my, my closing with you. You all know about the, the tradition of the challenge coin. And this particular coin was mine when I was chairman, um, although when I was, it has the chairman's flag on the front of it. On the back, it used to have the symbols of the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, and I even asked the Commandant of the Coast Guard if I could borrow his shield, and he was kind enough to let me do it. Now on the back of it, I have a phrase, and I'm going to tell you what that phrase is 
and ask you to embrace that phrase as you do your work here this week and, more importantly, when you go back to your hometowns. In 2003, I was commanding the 1st Armored Division in Baghdad. And when we first got there, some of you know this, I'm sure, we first got there, it wasn't dangerous, really. I mean, it was chaotic, but we weren't in the middle of an insurgency yet. And so we were, <coughs> we had some traffic accidents. We had, uh, I think we had a couple of negligent discharges. We, we, we were losing a, a few soldiers here and there, tragically, but it wasn't what it became. And then in August, it became what it was, what you know it to be, which was the, the Shia, the Kurds, and the Sunni didn't care for each other and took out, most of them took out their animosity on us. And we started to take casualties. Now, you know when you're in a leadership position and you begin to take casualties, you, you, you got to do something about it. And you feel the urgency, you feel the responsibility to do that. And so we, we had found that we had become a little complacent. Maybe our patterns were not random enough. We were, we were getting into uh, habits that uh, the enemy was picking up on. And we were able to kind of break that trend. Um, but one of the things um, that I experienced, and many of you have as well, is when you take casualties, particularly in a combat zone, there's always some kind of memorial service before, uh, for the, the remaining teammates so that the unit can have some closure um, as they've lost a teammate. And you know, you've, you've seen these ceremonies where there, there's a footlocker with an inverted rifle and, and boots and dog tags and a helmet. And then the soldiers, in my case, soldiers who had, we, because as you know, we had 32,000 soldiers in Baghdad, but they patrolled in groups of 12 to 16. And so if we lost one, the remaining 11 squad mates would be in the front row Everybody else would be in the back. The chaplain would speak. The company commander would speak. Uh, generally speaking, one or two of the soldiers, the teammates of the fallen would speak. And then taps would be played. And at the end of the ceremony, they always expected, and I think correctly so, the senior member present, enlisted and officer, to lead the way through and encourage those remaining squad mates to do their best and to, keep, and to keep on going because the mission was still important. And what I found was in my early days of doing that as a division commander is when they invited me up to begin to, to walk down the line of the remaining squad, first of all, I could see in their eyes the complex and competing emotions that some of you, many, many of you have seen of both fear and also guilt. Fear because they know they got to go out again the next day. And guilt because they, you can't help but wonder, why wasn't it me? Could I have done something more? And so when I walked up to these first couple of memorial services to the soldiers, I was actually, uh, you know, for the, honestly, for the first time in my life, almost at a loss for words. I mean, I just couldn't figure out a way to encourage them and console them, and yet I knew that was part of my job. And so the first couple of times I did it, I didn't do it well, and I knew I didn't do it well. And I'd go back, you know, to my headquarters or into my, you know, my containerized housing unit, and I would, I would fret about that. And then one night, um, you know that moment in the course of a night when you're kind of half, when you're almost going to wake up, you're kind of between asleep and awake, and your mind is clear, and oftentimes you have your best thoughts when your mind is clear and you're in those quiet moments. And I, I heard a phrase. I was half awake, and I heard a phrase echo in my head, make it matter. And I, I thought, I wonder what that's all about. Make it matter. And I thought, I got to get up and write this down. It, it means something. And, and by the way, I'm, I'm a man of faith, and so I'm, I'm, I'm of the belief that that wasn't coincidental. And I heard, make it matter. And I did not get up, and I did not write it down, and it did not go away. Two days later, we had a memorial ceremony. And I, again, I didn't know exactly what I was going to say when I was invited up to speak to the fallen, the squad mates of the fallen soldier. But as soon as I walked in front of the first one, I sh stuck out my hand, shook her hand, and said, 
make it matter. And I said the same thing to each soldier down the line. And it, it occurred to me that's exactly the right thing to say. You can't bring them back. You can't do anything about how it happened. You got to go back out there. But in the, in the way you go back out there, the way you decide to live your life from this point forward can, in fact, make that sacrifice matter. So I carry, I carry three, but I have 129 others at home. These are small cards that I had made for every soldier who fell under my watch as a division commander from 2003 to 2004. And I've got them on my desk. I've had it since, since 2004. I've got a, a little walnut cigar box with 129 cards, and I carry three in my wallet at all times. I rotate them. And on the box, I had engraved, make it matter. This coin I'm going to give to your commander in chief. Um, I want to give it to him on behalf of you to thank you for what you do. And what I'd like you to do, if you don't remember anything else about what I've said here to you today, remember this. You can make it matter. Make it matter. General, on behalf of the veterans of foreign wars, we will make it matter. Thank you, sir.